actually the last time I was at Bosque was 2004. I was a PhD student giving a talk about PSORT B, which was a tool I developed to predict protein localization in uh, bacterial genomes. So it's nice to be back. It's kind of been a while. Uh, and this morning we're going to talk about, I think, what's an ideal topic to start off a conference, uh, terrifying infectious diseases. Uh, it's, <laughs> it's a nice way to start your day. Um, one of the last times I gave a talk about terrifying infectious diseases at the start of a conference. That conference then had an outbreak of foodborne disease associated with some of the food that was served at the meeting. So I'm hoping, I'm really hoping that doesn't happen here. But if it does, collect your poo and send it to me and I will sequence it. And we can do some interesting analysis. So that's what I'm going to talk about today. Um, but thanks to Nomi and thanks to Peter for inviting me here. It's been a long time since I was in Orlando too. <laughs> This is me in 1989 at Epcot Center, uh, not looking especially impressed with the wonders of life. Fortunately, sometime between that picture and when I started university, my perspective changed. And so now I spend my entire day reading what you see in the background, double helices of DNA, and figuring out what does that mean for infectious disease and infectious disease control. And what I've come to realize over the last few years of working in public health is that every century we've kind of had like a great innovation in the 17th century, well, 1700s, 18th century, vaccination was invented, Edward Jenner and the smallpox vaccine. In the 19th century, you had sanitation. Suddenly we figured out it was probably not a good idea to throw our poop into the streets. Maybe we should build sewers. 20th century, of course, we had antibiotics. I don't know how much longer we're going to have them for, but I really think think the 21st century great miracle when it comes to understanding infectious diseases and preventing infectious disease is going to be data and open data in particular. So that's what I'm going to talk about today. I got my start. Uh, here's another blast from the past. Um, I got inspired on my career journey by this movie. It is a horrible idea to base your entire career choice upon seeing a Dustin Hoffman film, especially this one, which is, which is not a great movie. There's a lot of better infectious disease movies out there. But it got me interested in infectious diseases and, and how they shape our lives. So I studied microbiology and and genetics as an undergrad. This was at the time that the first bacterial genome was being sequenced, so it wasn't even really genomics yet. It was still genetics. I did a PhD in Fiona Brinkman's lab, where Karsten was a postdoc, um, working on PSORB, developing methods for um, making inferences about localization from uh, just amino acid sequence alone. Did a postdoc at UBC looking at infection from the other side of the coin, the, the host immunology technological perspective and working on some network analysis and some information visualization techniques. Uh, and since 2009, I've been at the BC Center for Disease Control as well as at the University of British Columbia taking everything I'd kind of picked up on my bioinformatics journey and squishing it into essentially kind of a new field, which is the idea of using genome sequencing of pathogens and uh, bioinformatics analysis to really understand how outbreaks of infectious disease start, how they spread from person to person, and most importantly, how can we take that information and use it to develop new and better ways of managing outbreaks. So I'll talk about that kind of at the end of the presentation presentation or towards the end. But I thought I'd share what I thought was one of the most surprising observations when I joined the public health world in 2009. I'd come from academia before that um, and didn't really know what public health practice was like. And I was really surprised when I started working at a center for disease control, this is probably not what you want to hear about your local CDC, by the way, it's just we don't know what a lot of infectious diseases are doing. As public health practitioners, as experts, as the people that stand between you, know, you and the zombie apocalypse, we, we don't know a lot about how these bugs behave. <clears throat> 
We don't know, for example, much about where new emerging infectious diseases come from. If we did, we'd certainly be better at stopping things like H1N1, like MERS, um, like the Zika virus in Brazil. And once diseases get into populations, we don't have very good ideas about how they spread from person to person. Because there's a lot of stuff that's kind of basic that we know. Um, we know birds are jerks. Uh, we know that they are these wonderful reservoirs within which influenza viruses are constantly recombining, making new strains of flu that migratory waterfowl will carry from Asia and, and deposit into North America and Europe and introduce new pandemic potential viruses. We know that bats are jerks too if we're just painting the whole winged animal kingdom with one uh, broad paint brush. They're full of coronaviruses and really interesting new pathogens. Anytime there's something like SARS or MERS, Ebola, you can usually trace it back to a bat. But even though we know where some of these infectious diseases are coming from, which animal vectors are carrying them, we still don't know geographically where a new virus is going to emerge or when that jump is going to happen. Zika was a great example of that recently. Ebola in West Africa, too. We'd never seen Ebola disease in that part of the world, and all of a sudden, here it was, and it took us by surprise. And when it comes to disease transmission, too, we don't know a lot either. <clears throat> You know, we know the basics. We know things like tuberculosis, which is my pet pathogen that I sequence a lot of. And we know it's spread by coughing, by spitting, by close talkers. So don't be a close talker. Um, we know that uh, measles is airborne. We know that the flu and the cold transmit via droplet transmission. But we don't know much about how outbreaks behave as a whole. You know, if I've got an outbreak of tuberculosis in Vancouver, British Columbia, how similar is it going to to be to an outbreak of TB in Orlando, Florida? Do they follow similar patterns? Is it something about the pathogen that, that makes them behave in the same way? Is it something about the social contact network of the hosts that makes it behave in the same way? Do they behave entirely different? Are outbreaks stochastic processes and, and no outbreak looks like any other one? We have no idea how these things behave, so we have no idea how to make kind of rational evidence-based decisions around how we manage these outbreaks of disease. So I really think that data, especially genomics and, and bioinformatics derived data, is what's going to help us answer these questions. So let's look at those two issues in the next little while. Let's look at, first of all, how can we use data as a tool to figure out where the next pandemic is going to come from? And let's look at how we can use data, specifically genomic data, um, as a tool for understanding how diseases spread within populations. So first question, where do new diseases come from? It would be great if they came with a little birth announcement and it's like, hey, public health, by the way, there is this new strain of flu. It's circulating here. It's going to show up on your doorstep pretty soon. You should get ready for it. Maybe start getting a vaccine together. That would be fantastic. My job would be so much easier. But diseases don't come with birth announcements. They just barge in like an uninvited house guest which is probably also true of some babies, but um, infectious disease, I, I don't have any, so I can say things like that. Um, infectious diseases are a huge issue. A lot of people uh, tend to kind of overlook them in favor of more sexy diseases that have a lot of uh, you know, money and, and research grants attached to them, um, but infectious diseases are a massive deal. We, if we look globally at the world, um, 56 million people on average uh, die every year which is a cheerful statistic to start your Friday morning with. Um, and of those 56 million, Globally, about a third of those deaths are caused by an infectious disease of some sort. But of course, as with anything health-related, um, the disparities are sort of not equally distributed around the world. The death rates in lower-income countries due to infectious diseases are about five times what they are in high-income countries. In a place like the United States or Canada, you have about a 1 in 10 chance of dying due to an infectious disease or a complication from an infectious disease if you are living in a low-income country, about two-thirds of deaths are attributable to, attributable to IDs. So these are a massive issue, an issue that doesn't get a lot of attention. Some infectious diseases, they've been with us for 
ages, you know, all of recorded history. Tuberculosis, my favorite bug, uh, has been with humans for tens of thousands of years. This is evidence of TB infection in a mummy lung from many thousands of years ago. But other diseases are new. Other diseases emerge onto the scene, and we call these EIDs, Emerging Infectious Diseases. There's even a journal called EID. If you want to terrify yourself on a monthly basis, you can subscribe to it and see you know, what is making people weak this week, what do you have to worry about. Um, and EIDs, they kind of come in a few different forms. There's um, what we would call the old foes in new disguises, things like uh, antimicrobial resistant infections, uh, superbugs. You know, Staph aureus has been around for millions and millions and millions of years, but now all of a sudden we have methicillin resistant Staph aureus, or the vancomycin resistant enterococci. So we've got old foes and new forms. Sometimes uh, an emerging infectious disease is something that's been with us for a little while, but is suddenly just exploding in terms of case counts. Um, this is a nice example of Lyme disease in the United States. This is the incidence data for 2001 from CDC. And if you skip ahead to 2013, you can see that thanks to climate change, which is also a jerk, um, we've got this massive expansion of the area in which you find ticks that are infected with Borrelia. And you're seeing exactly the same thing unfold fold right now uh, with Zika virus in Brazil. Our changing climate, changing globalization is taking diseases that were previously in just one part of the world. Um, we've known about Zika virus since 1947, but it's never been a big deal up until its jump into Brazil uh, last October. The other type of pathogen that's out there, of course, are absolutely brand new bugs that we've never seen before. Um, this is the SARS coronavirus, uh, famously jumped out of bats into wild cats in uh, Southeast Asia or East Asia in 2003. And from there, thanks to plane rides, uh, made it to North America fairly quickly. We're now seeing Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, a similar coronavirus uh, unfolding. It looks like it's bats to camels to humans in that case uh, happening in Saudi Arabia at the moment. So sometimes you get old bugs that you've seen before emerging or re-emerging, and sometimes you get totally new threats that we've never seen. The population is immune naive to these things, and you've got pandemic potential. These things can spread really quickly. There's a load of the new infectious diseases out there. More and more of these are appearing every decade. This is a lovely survey that was done looking at all of the diseases that emerged uh, since 1940. And even when you account for confounding factors, like the fact that we're just better able to identify new infectious diseases, we have better health systems, better surveillance systems, the number of things that are spilling over largely from animal populations into us is increasing year after year after after a year. And we know where this is happening. This is another really nice piece of work that is essentially a disease hotspot map. It integrates all of the factors that we know influence the emergence of infectious disease and sort of paints areas of the globe according to the risk of them being the source of a new terrifying cootie. Um, these are things like population density, movement in and out or between particular cities, um, the way uh, the climate is, the way the climate is changing, things like wildlife species density um, and the amount of the diversity of wildlife and other factors as well, things like war, things like social unrest that tend to destabilize healthcare and surveillance systems. And if you look at the red spots on the map and the yellow spots, it essentially does a pretty good job at capturing a lot of the recently emerged infectious diseases. Um, I'll use Mr. Pointer here. Um, H1N1 emerged out of Mexico. Uh, if we look at SARS, um, that came out of the Middle East. I lost my dot. There's my dot. It came out of the Middle East. Uh, Ebola virus was showing up in, where is the dot? There's the dot. It was showing up in West Africa. And then Zika on the uh, east coast of Brazil that's sort of colored yellow. And you've got a couple red dots down here closer to the big cities. So, 
if we know where these things are coming from, why are we still being surprised by them? And the answer is that we're just not looking for emerging infectious diseases in any sort of timely way. Um, these these hotspots that I just showed you on the previous slide, a lot of these correspond to really under-resourced areas. There's not good healthcare systems there. Um, and what you end up with is just a lack of surveillance, a lack of case reporting, a lack of data, and a lack of data sharing. So what happens is instead of an early case of something new triggering an alert and triggering a response, nothing happens. We just don't have any systems to collect this sort of data and to share this sort of data and to act on this sort of data. And the Ebola outbreak kind of gives a, a nice example of that. It actually started back in 2013 in December um, with the death of the, the first patient who was a toddler who was suspected of um, picking up the virus when he was playing in a tree, a tree that had been hit by a lightning bolt and had sort of been burned out, and all the children of the village were using it as a, a cool play space, but all the bats of the village were also using it as a place to poop and sleep, and so he came into contact likely with um, either a bat directly, um, potentially a bat bite, or bat guano, bat poo, that contained the Ebola virus. He was the first patient. It wasn't until the um, middle or late March of 2014 that the first email alert went out on a system called ProMed. Um, ProMed is a fantastic example of how when you just share information, good things happen. This is a free uh, newsletter. Anybody sub can subscribe to it. It's put together by a, a foundation, a not-for-profit foundation that exists to improve infectious disease surveillance. And if you are an infectious disease uh, clinician, a medical health officer, a public health person somewhere, and you see something that you need to alert on, you can uh, send an issue out or send an email out through ProMed. First alert came out in March 22nd. ProMed actually works. Um, within three days of that alert going out, we had a suspected Ebola case in Canada, somebody that had traveled to West Africa and had symptoms compatible with Ebola. And so they were tested very quickly and ruled out as being Ebola. Just goes to show the network works. But it wasn't until uh, later June that Médecins Sans Frontières said, holy shit, this thing has gone totally out of control. And it wasn't until uh, a couple days after that that the World Health Organization finally spoke up. And it wasn't until August that they declared a public health emergency. So you had this massive sort of missed surveillance gap, this failed opportunity to capitalize on data. And in the end, you had nearly 30,000 cases and over 10,000 deaths. So, when I joined public health, I was surprised by um, how bureaucratic it was and how coming from an academic community where everything I'd done had been open source and everything I did relied on the free availability of microbial genomes so I could do these great comparative analyses and develop these tools, I was really stunned by the lack of sharing and the lack of sensible thinking about data. Uh, in public health, the goal is to hoard your data and keep it close and not even share it with the person down the hall. And when we protect databases over the public's health, something is wrong. So I have this poster in my office as a reminder just to get out there and do stuff, even though public health agencies want me to do boring, sh like make strategic plans and say how my vision aligns with the organization. I just want to get out there and do stuff. And this is happening in terms of getting creative with how we use data, making it open to the community, um, academics and increasingly public health organizations are starting to do some cool things that are going to help us figure out where the next emerging infectious disease comes from. What are some of the things that are happening? Well, we're figuring out how to establish surveillance hotspot systems. So I showed you that map of where the next emerging infectious diseases are likely to come from. Let's start looking not just in people, but in the environment, in animals, in the, the guano that we can pick up from a bat farm, for example. We can use biosensors. We now have the Oxford nanopore, the minion. It's the size of a USB stick. It's USB powered. You can take this into the field 
field and sequence there. I'm sending a friend of mine out. He's going to Africa up the Okavango Delta in August, and we're trying to send him out with one of these min ions so he can sequence elephant craps that he finds along the way and see, you know, what are the elephants eating and what's getting into the elephants in terms of pathogens. So we can look at, you know, what are the viruses, what are the bacteria present in the environment, present in animals, what's new, what's an emerging threat that might jump into our population. We can also look at what is coming out of our populations, or our populations in this case. This is a sewage treatment plant. That is a giant thing full of boo. And we can analyze that with biosensors. We can, in real time, be sequencing what's coming out of there, looking for interesting things. And you know, it sounds like kind of a gross, far-off idea, but we're actually doing this now. This is a fantastically odd and interesting little article from uh, about a year and a half ago, a group in um, <clears throat> a group in Amsterdam somehow convinced KLM Airways to give them the waste of the, uh, all of their airline flights that were coming in from other continents, and they sequenced the airplane's collected um, you know, poop bucket and said, what's in here? And can we see how antimicrobial resistance elements are moving around the world? How are things like MCR1, this colistin resistance gene that everybody's worried about, how are these spreading. You don't have to have a crazy biosensor. You can have something that's as simple as a, a cellular telephone. Um, just giving citizens, giving farmers, giving veterinarians a tool that will allow them to generate data, generate their own observations, and share those via an open platform for surveillance. Uh, David Annenson at Imperial College London has developed uh, EpiCollect, a free app that people can put on any one of their various smartphone platforms there and go out into the field and collect data that then gets stored in a standardized ontology-based database. So it's shareable, it's extensible across projects, and really easily can be leveraged as a tool in settings where there might not be a good healthcare system, but it sure as shit, everybody's got a cell phone and they use it. School Global Threats Fund runs these things called EpiHacks. This is a hackathon where the goal is to make a product useful for epidemiological surveillance. If you've got a problem in your part of the world, right, like, hey, you know, we're seeing a lot of cases of, to use a Vancouver example, you know, Cryptococcus gadii. We want to be able to develop a surveillance system that our vets can report into. We need something a bit more sophisticated than, you know, EpiCollect on a bunch of phones. You can apply to do an EpiHack and and a group of experts, a group of programmers will come and say, okay, what's your health problem? Let's work together to develop a software solution to fix it. Super, super cool. This whole area is what we are calling digital epidemiology or digital disease detection. You know it's official when there's a conference about it. Uh, it happens every couple of years, and it's super, super interesting. Really, the principle here is let's look at open data streams as alternative sources of health and surveillance information. Health map is probably the granddaddy of these uh, sort of internet-based surveillance systems. It reads in newspapers from all over the world. It reads in alerts issued by health agencies all over the world. It reads in tweets from key accounts. And an algorithm is constantly in sort of real time collating these alerts, assessing them, and then they're reviewed in order to determine what's happening outbreak-wise. So you can load a region onto the map and say, okay, what outbreaks, what alerts are happening near me today? There's an app for it too, Outbreaks Near Me. You can put it on your phone uh, and see what exactly is happening in the vicinity of Disney World, uh, who's got what around here. And just to show you how good a job HealthMap does is when you go back to the um, Ebola outbreak, this is the timeline that I showed you earlier, this is when the first HealthMap alert came out. Uh, their automated algorithms managed to pick this up um, more than a week ahead of the first alert going out on ProMed Mail. On March 14th, they picked up some reports of hemorrhagic fever as yet undiagnosed uh, in Guinea. And as you followed it through time, uh, you were able to see uh, eventually there was the diagnosis of Ebola, the confirmation on March 22nd. 
This was kind of a famously failed experiment, but it was a nice idea. Um, the algorithm turned out to get sort of too polluted by other search terms. This was Google flu trends, and the idea was that if people had the flu, they would probably be going to Google and, and saying, you know, what am I sick with? What does a runny nose mean? What does a cough mean? And by tracking searches for different symptoms, you could start to predict when the flu season was really sort of beginning in an area. So it worked great for a season or two, and then it started to get over overloaded by, by noise and the signal became a bit less clear. One of my favorite examples of scraping open data on to, to do infectious disease surveillance is the Nemesis project. This is an algorithm that looks for, it's just restrained to Manhattan right now as kind of proof of principle. It looks for people who tweet uh, and have tagged a restaurant in their tweet. So they've checked in and they said, oh, this tweet is coming from you know the McDonald's on, on 57th Avenue. And as soon as it sees somebody in the the catchment area of Manhattan that has tagged a restaurant, they enroll that user into their Twitter surveillance stream and they follow them for the next 100 hours, which is typically the time frame over which if you ate something bad, you would find yourself feeling bad. So they then monitor that user's tweets for the occurrence of any terms that indicate they're in some state of gastrointestinal distress. Uh, and they can then say, well, maybe was that associated with the meal that they ate earlier. And what they found was that the restaurants that did reg register positive signals for within 100 hours, people feeling crappy, uh, tended to be the ones that if you went back to the New York Health Department and looked at their restaurant inspections, they were the, uh, the underperformers, we'll call them. So some very, very interesting stuff there. And so when it comes to disease detection, if this is something that you're interested in as a bioinformatician, I think some of the, the opportunities here are, can we develop better algorithms for the rapid identification of pathogens from biosensor data? So if you've got an Oxford nanopore out in the field, can we rapidly figure out, you know, what's a pathogen versus what's, you know, normal environmental bacteria environment? viruses, normal human flora, uh, and really get a nice reliable signal there. A big issue that's starting to pop up with some of the nanopore issues um, or nanopore uh, studies that are happening out in the field is that in the past, a lot of the computing has had to be done in the cloud or on servers. Um, but what if you're just out there with a tiny laptop? What if you're out there with only a very crappy satellite phone connection to, to the cloud? Um, how can you do what are computational, uh, computationally quite intensive jobs that often rely on sending data back and forth to servers, how can you do that when you're essentially in the middle of nowhere with, with very limited power? So can, can we scale down computing? Um, can we, as bioinformaticians, take the many algorithms that we've developed and say, okay, well, what else can I apply this to? I've been applying this to, you know, genome sequence data or, or transcriptomic data or chip seq data. Um, is there an application for this in understanding a different data type? Can I somehow do something with Twitter data on this or social network data? And I think we need to lead our colleagues um, by our open source example, a fantastic example of what happens when bioinformaticians lead public health projects is this. This is Nick Lohman's Zebra Project, Zika in Brazil Real-Time Analysis. The project website is on GitHub. Everything is open access. Data will be generated as uh, or open released as soon as it's generated. Contrast this to what happens when public health people try and talk about data sharing. I've deleted the author's names off of this um, so that they don't feel publicly shamed, but this is an article on why sharing data for outbreak detection is important, and it's behind a paywall. <laughs> so it's Christian Anderson, who's a an really awesome uh, LASA virologist, sequencer slash bioinformatician uh, currently at Scripps, tweeted out, uh, oh, but you're doing it all wrong. So lead by example and get your colleagues sharing data. 
So uh, of course, everybody in this room reads binary, yay. Um, that says data can help us track emerging infectious diseases. But I said at the outset, um, it also helps us understand what happens once a disease gets into a population. Uh, and that's really the area that I spend a lot of my research focused on, um, using genomics and bioinformatics as a tool to figure out you know, who coughed on who in an outbreak. And the reason I do it is because, as I said at the outset, we still don't have a really good idea of how diseases spread in populations. You know, we know the basics, like, you know, Peter sneezes, <laughs> and then maybe you know me sitting next to him gets a droplet and <laughs> gets that. Wash your hands. Um, I have hand sanitizer like a good public health person. Um, so we know the basics, you know, droplet transmission, airborne transmission. But as I said earlier, we don't know, you know, do all outbreaks behave the same? Is it features of the pathogen that influence how a disease happens? This is the, uh, well, they've renamed it now for obvious reasons, but this was was the Metropole Hotel in Kowloon uh, in Hong Kong, where a doctor with SARS stayed on, I think it was the ninth floor, and famously ended up infecting most of the floor. This is a hotel that's frequented by travelers because it's not far from the Hong Kong airport. And all of those travelers in those hotel rooms that got infected by this doctor went off to their various parts of the world, bringing SARS with them, including to Canada, where we had a fairly large outbreak uh, in Toronto. Um, this doctor was what we would call a super spreader or a super shedder. He was somebody that caused a large number of, of secondary cases. So understanding how infectious diseases spread allows us to answer questions like, is this a common feature in SARS? Are we always going to be seeing super spreaders who we really need to sort of be on the lookout for and design outbreak management strategies to kind of t to catch. Um, so we need to understand how these pathogens behave. We need to understand how people behave too and how our contact network structure affects how diseases move through populations. You know, diseases are much likely uh, to flow through a, a densely connected high degree network than they are a fairly sparse one. Um, so how do these things influence pathogen movement? So the way we've always understood outbreaks in the past, the way we've looked at them, um, really dates back to the 19th century. This is probably the most famous image in public health, and what I think is one of the very first examples of an information visualization used for public health interventions. This was uh, John Snow, not the Game of Thrones John Snow, the hairy doctor uh, in, in London in the 1860s John Snow, who was investigating a cholera outbreak in the Soho neighborhood, and he went around and just knocked on doors and said, has there been a cholera case? in this neighborhood. And if there was, he put a little tick on that address, a little black bar, and he saw that most of the uh, ticks were sort of collected around a street called Broad Street. Um, it's now renamed to Broadwick Street. Uh, and there was a pump, a water pump, on the corner of Broadwick and little windmill street, and he removed the uh, handle from the pump, hypothesizing that perhaps the cholera infection was in the water of that particular pump takes the pump handle off and the outbreak abates. And although this was the 1860s, the way we investigate outbreaks really hasn't changed a lot. You know, we have these surveillance systems that uh, identify potential outbreaks. They say, hey, you've got a lot more cases of TB in this region than we would ordinarily see in this place over this particular time. Maybe you should take a look at these. So we go in with a technique uh, from the molecular epidemiology world. We would do some DNA fingerprinting. Um, these are the same sort of techniques you'd see on a crime show like CSI or when they do the Mori Povich, You Are Not the Father episodes. Um, these are typically variable number tandem repeat typing based techniques looking at just a tiny bit of the DNA in our organism. And they would say, okay, well, out of all the cases, these, you know, whatever that is, eight or 10, have the same fingerprint. They might be a cluster, they might be a true outbreak. And then, you know, John Snow style, we go in and knock on doors and talk to people and try and figure out what the connections between those individuals are. These methods don't work particularly well. They only tell us that there's a cluster of cases. They don't, uh, the genomic methods at least, or the genotyping methods, don't tell us who might have infected who. Um, depending on the technique that you use, there's a number of different DNA fingerprinting techniques that are out there. You might get very different perspective of who belongs to your outbreak and who doesn't. And then just going out and doing that John Snow stuff, talking to people and finding those connections is really difficult. Public health has like zero dollars 
dollars. Cancer gets all the dollars. We get no dollars at all. So we rarely have enough people or enough money to go do a proper outbreak investigation. So this is where genomics comes to the rescue. If this dot, this blue dot in the background represents the totality of information contained in an organism's genome, say, you know, the 4.4 million base pairs that makes up the tuberculosis genome, the little red dot in the center is the amount of that genomic information that we're interrogating with most of our DNA fingerprinting techniques. There's a whole lot of unexplored information out there. And the idea is if we use that unexplored information, if we look at the totality of the genome, genome, we can go from a very low resolution picture of our outbreak to a high resolution picture. This is really just an excuse to show a picture of a cat. Um, the genomic epidemiology is what we call this idea, the notion that if we read the whole genome sequences from the pathogens that we take out of each person involved in an outbreak, we can track how that bug is spreading from person to person. Principle is very simple. You've got a bacteria. It uh, replicates over time, as bacteria do, and with each replication or so, a couple of mutations will accrue. Those will be passed on to daughter cells, as you know, microbiology 101 here. But what's nice is that this process is happening within people. So as these mutations arise over the course of an outbreak, we can trace them in the, the people that we're taking these pathogens out of. Conceptually, it's really similar, or is it simple? It's like the telephone game where I, everybody plays this in like elementary school, a teacher will line you up in a line, whisper a sentence to the first kid who whispers it to the next kid, to the next kid, to the next kid. Sentence reaches the end of the line, kid at the end says what they heard, uh, kid at the beginning says the sentence that was whispered to them and everybody laughs because it's different. The sentence is mutated as it's spread down the line. Exactly the same thing is happening to a pathogen genome as it's moving forward in time, as it's passing from person to person, it's accruing these changes. So with genomic epidemiology, what we're basically doing is the same as if you did this little telephone game with the kids, then said, okay, shuffle yourselves around the room and you ask each kid what sentence they heard and you figure out the order they were sitting in based on what they tell you. We're reading the DNA, we're looking for the occurrence of mutations and based on the, the presence or absence of those mutations shared between particular isolates, we can say, oh, you know, person A likely infected person B. So we kind of kicked this whole field off, uh, I guess, about you know, five years ago now with this paper. Since then, the number of papers in this field has just skyrocketed. Uh, if we just look at a screen capture of just from the last couple of weeks, this is just sort of a con contiguous screen grab off of PubMed, you've got papers using genomics to look at everything from polio, uh, vaccine-induced polio virus clusters, to how, you know, Staph aureus USA 300 is spreading. Loads and loads of papers coming out in this area. The data is really simple. This is just a visualization of what it looks like. Each row is an M. tuberculosis isolate taken from a patient in an outbreak in British Columbia. This is a multiple sequence alignment of all of the MTB genome that we've read where we've stripped out every column that's 100% identical in our outbreak because those are not going to be informative as to transmission. Out of the 4.4 million base pairs, there's only 21 that vary over the course of an outbreak. These are them. Gray, wild type base, color equals a mutation. This outbreak, using genotyping techniques, Everybody was identical, and any one person in this outbreak could have infected anybody else. It would have been a load of work to go in and do all the individual epidemiology and figure out who was most likely to have infected whom, especially because about three quarters of these cases were all at the same homeless shelter. Incredibly difficult to figure out what happened. But when we look at the whole genome sequence, suddenly enough resolution appears that we can kind of divide the outbreak into some groups. We've got a group up top, we've got this group with this mutation then this uh, mutation sort of shows up. I've got this other group down here with these three mutations. We've got a much higher resolution picture. What we've been working on, um, we haven't just sort of rested on our laurels and said, okay, let's reconstruct a bunch of outbreaks. We know there's a lot of um, sort of evolution and biology that messes with the idea of very simply kind of picking out who might have infected who. Um, so just so I give you some bioinformatics and math so you know that I actually do do this stuff, um, briefly one of the things that we're working on right now is how do you take genomic data um, like this, and of course you just take the concatenated variation in FASTA format, how can you 
automatically infer transmission events from this? How can you take this and say, okay, out of these 33 cases, who was most likely to have infected whom? Um, so that's work that a few different groups have been active in, uh, including ourselves. This is uh, work done with some colleagues at Imperial College London. Uh, I'm not going to go through in great detail this method, uh, TransPhilo. It's implemented in MATLAB at the moment, and we're porting it to R, and that paper should be on BioArchive uh, within the next month or so. And it's a simple, uh, a simple principle. We basically say, okay, if you've got a transmission tree of people that infected each other, this pointer is my nemesis, um, so A infects B and D, D goes on to infect C. If you take the bacteria out of those five people, sequence those bacterial genomes, build a phylogenetic tree, tree of those, can we somehow infer this from this? Um, you can read the paper if you want to know how we do it. I'm just going to skip over it mathy like this. Um, but essentially what you get are two things. We use BEAST, um, the Bayesian phylogenetics tool that creates time-labeled phylogenetic trees, to essentially draw a phylogenetic tree of the outbreak. Uh, we color the tree according to which branch of that tree, which lineage of bacteria was within a host at a particular time, and we place dots on the tree when that lineage jumped from one host to the other. In other words, when person A infected person B. We don't just do this once over one tree. We do this tens of thousands of times over many, many trees. And then we throw some MCMC inference at it and take those many thousands of trees and come up with a putative social network describing the outbreak. Here, each node is a person. They're connected by an arrow, an edge. If they uh, could have reasonably infected the, another person, another node in that graph, um, according to the genomic data. So super interesting stuff. For the first time, we're kind of taking epidemiology out of epidemiology and just relying on genomic and evolutionary signals. What's nice about this method, too, is it doesn't just tell you who likely infected who. It tells you with more math when that infection likely occurred. Um, this is data that we published about two months ago in a new journal. If you sequence anything microbial related, I would encourage you to publish in microbial genomics. We shall be indexed on PubMed soon, but we are an open access online only and open data journal. Um, you can't get away with saying, you know, we used an in-house script for the analysis. If you want to publish in microbial genomics, you got to give us that script. It better be on GitHub. Um, so we published this and I'll just show you this figure quickly. Um, this is uh, that outbreak in the homeless shelter. What we've got here, the gray circles indicate when an individual might have been infected according to our genomic calculations. The white circles indicate when they were diagnosed. The black line is the duration of their infection. A difficult thing to do in TB control is declare an outbreak over um, because TB can go latent. It can be in somebody and then wake up and cause disease many years later. We generally say an outbreak is over when it's been two years since the last transmission event. But we have a problem in that when we've got new cases appearing, we have no idea whether they were just infected, somebody just transmitted disease to them, or whether somebody transmitted disease two years ago, three years ago, five years ago, and their chronic latent infection is just waking up now. But with TransPhilo, we can figure that out. So we were able to identify when the last transmission event occurred. And even though we had cases diagnosed after that, we could draw an arrow two years out from that last transmission, go down the graph and say that's when our outbreak could be declared over. And so we actually use this in public health control. This is the memo that said January 29th, this outbreak was declared over as a result of this genomic data. This is being used in other ways, too, in the Ebola outbreak, uh, sequencing and analysis of a bunch of Ebola genomes revealed how the virus got from Guinea into Sierra Leone, how there was a super spreading event uh, at a funeral. This data also showed that it was a single introduction of the virus into the population uh, and then human to human transmission that kept the outbreak going. It wasn't repeated introductions from wildlife reservoirs, and that had important uh, implications for 
for public health messaging at the time. Towards the end of the outbreak, genomics has also proved useful. We've learned for the first time that with Ebola virus, you see survivor transmission. The virus can survive in bodily fluids for up to at least a year, we're seeing so far. And uh, in this case, a survivor here, uh, a year later, transmitted to an individual that they had sexual contact with, sequencing of their virus revealed there was just a single nucleotide difference confirming that transmission event. The Ebola paper has two key phrases in it. We immediately released sequence data and we relied on multidisciplinary and international efforts to take this shared open genomic data and make sense of it. We've seen this happen with H1N1 in 2009. Andy Rambo started an open wiki-based lab notebook where people could share information about uh, the H1N1 sequences that they'd analyzed using phylogenetics. That information led to a number of important insights into how H1N1 was spreading um, and, and estimates of things like the reproductive ratio that are really important for us as public health in assessing the risk uh, that a virus poses. Andy's open lab notebook has now evolved into virological.org, an open lab notebook for the real-time data sharing and analysis of emerging viral pathogens, Ebola, Zika. It's led to things like Next Flu from Trevor Bedford and Richard Nair. This is a wonderfully interactive kind of infoviz approach to looking at, in this case, influenza genomic data. They've also looked at Ebola genomic data, and now they're, of course, looking at Zika data. Again, all open data um, and real-time analysis accessible to anybody. David Annenson, again, who built EpiCollect, he's built MicroReact, where you can upload a phylogenetic tree tagged with genetic information, and anybody can create, using this online kind of viz-based platform, an interactive tool for exploring your phylogenetic data and sharing it with the community. It's really remarkable. In the E. coli outbreak um, in 2011, there were cases that were appearing in Germany. They were at first blamed on Spanish cucumbers. Uh, it turned out not to be the Spanish cucumbers. It was Egyptian sprouts. But just to show you how you know, a self-organizing community, the microbial genomics world, is incredibly sherry, and we tend to share via, via Twitter. This is the area that we all kind of hang out in. Um, June 2nd, a tweet goes out from from BGI saying, hey, we've sequenced this new E. coli outbreak strain. Uh, Nick Lohman and I were at a conference together sitting next to each other about using bacterial genomics for epidemiology. Nick grabs the data, runs it through uh, his assembly pipeline, posts a blog about it saying, hey, I've made a, an assembly of this. Feel free to grab this and do whatever analysis you want to do on it. People grab the genome. They start analyzing. They're posting their results to the wiki page. Uh, and it just grows and grows and grows. People from all around the world are contributing these amazing analyses. And in July, they get a New England Journal paper out of it, characterized by, you know, this wonderful sentence, open source analysis, crowdsourced analyses, and a liberal approach to data release. So I'll finish by saying, when it comes to bioinformatics opportunities in the disease tracking world, if this is something that you want to get involved in, obviously we rely on loads of genomic and bioinformatics tools to analyze genome data. So yes, build those. Keep building your BWAs and your SAM tools and, and your tablets and your IGVs, because we need all of those things. But some of the unexplored opportunities, I think, are, um, I showed you TransPhilo, it's mostly math. These tools are being built by evolutionary biologists and mathematicians working together. Rarely do we have a sort of a bioinformatician that's properly part of the team making these tools usable. You'll find a lot of really good papers on inferring infectious disease transmission events from genomic data. They're all math. They're no implementation. We need people to help us implement this stuff in a user-friendly way, especially because clinicians and public health agencies that don't have bioinformatics experience are starting to sequence genomes and we need to make it as easy and as foolproof for them as possible. So we need your help there. I think 
infoviz as a field is something that really needs to be explored more by those of us in the computational space. They're an amazing field. They're this incredible discipline. They do fantastic work. They can tell us as people you know, showing data, they can tell us how to show that data better, how to make it interactive, how to make it interpretable in ways that reduce the cognitive burden on our users. So find an information visualization collaborator and work with them. And get on Twitter too, because a lot of interesting problems unfold in real time on Twitter and these amazing crowdsourced analyses happen. It's a really cool space to hang out. So with that, um, I'll leave you with my Twitter handle and where you can find me email-wise, bccdc.ca. Um, thanks to people that give me money to do stuff. Uh, I'm happy to take a few questions and watch out for foodborne illness at the conference and keep washing your hands. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.